Well, now I want to introduce a very important speaker, Emiliano Rodriguez Norsch. Emiliano is a risk communications specialist. He is the director at Risk Communications Agency Pacifico with projects in more than 40 countries in partnership with the World Bank, NASA, and other organizations using non-conventional tools like music, art, and games. But there is something very interesting about his resume. When he was a child, he came to this beach where we are now, Jurere, and he wanted to learn how to surf. That's what he told to his father. But he didn't like the lack of waves here at Surere. You know, he wasn't very happy about it. So he was sent to Praia da Joaquina, Joaquina Beach. And it was not a good idea. You know, he is still trying to learn how to surf. But let's welcome now, please, Emiliano. Thank you. Obrigado. I keep trying. I, I promise I will make it one day. I'm really happy to be back in Floripa. During the next few days, we will be discussing how we can better prepare as a community for scenarios of new types of risk, or new waves of continuous and multi-hazard risk. Uh, in a world that is incredibly, increasingly complex and in which we seem to be disconnected from so many of the mechanisms of the systems that we use, both technological and natural. Take the cell phone, for example. I can be a, a master using all the applications in the cell phone, but that is as long as a consumer, as, as long as I'm a consumer. But if I really want to know how this is uh, interchanging or sharing my personal data, it works like a black box. So in a way, I'm disconnected of this system that I'm using a lot. And something similar is happening to the natural events that we are dealing with. In the last month, I had a conversation with many survivors of Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas and having a conversation with a woman, um, she told me that for decades, they had been preparing as a family, doing what their father had taught them. But this time, for Dorian, it just wasn't enough. Like getting together as a family to ride the storm at home, taking lots of protective measures wasn't enough because it was a completely different type of event. You may call it, she said, a storm, a super storm, but this is something different. Next time we know we will have to leave. So I guess that if we need to prepare as a community to reconnect with risk, what we, we'll have to uh, understand the mechanism and use new lenses uh, so that we can do our work better. So what I bring today is different lenses that will help us zoom in and zoom out to connect with those systems, both the technological and the natural. These are things that I learned. Uh, and I'll try to answer the question of how we will prepare, uh, what type of use of tools we will use, and also how we will deal emotionally with it. The first one is the maker lenses. And I'll start um, with those lenses because it's about building and understanding how things are built, because we want to understand how we build and we create risk. And I start with risk by nuggets. Nuggets, they don't seem, feel risky, but they are risky. They are really, really unhealthy. So this chef called Jamie Olivier, he decided to teach kids about how unhealthy they are by inviting them to cook them. So the system of risk with the nuggets is you take the chicken, you take the meat, you're not going to use the meat, you take the rest, you mix it, you add chemicals to stabilize it, and then you fry it. So the kids go. And then they completely see a new way of connecting with the risk. Of course, some of them still want to eat them, but the rest, I'm sure they will remember for their whole lives that this is risky. Let's apply that learning to early warning. Early warnings are abstract, right? Uh, understanding uh, interpretation, detection, alerting, there's complex systems. In this picture, you see uh, communities in Los Angeles building a seismic sensor and building a low-cost early warning system so that next time when there's an earthquake, they can measure the impact of the earthquake and share information with the university, and they can have a conversation with the university about what they are experiencing in the neighborhood. They are becoming part of the system. That system that was detached from them, now it becomes a bit more human. This is a museum in Noshima Island in Japan. This is the fault that triggered the earthquake in Kobe 1995, a huge earthquake. In there, they built a museum so that you get into the ground and you see the fault. So now you can learn about how 
earthquakes occur. And that difference between magnitude and intensity is so difficult, so abstract to understand it. When you see it, you can touch the fault there. So you can understand magnitude. The size of the fracture when those tectonic plates collide is going to be the magnitude. And the intensity is going to be how intense or how much you move over there where you live, which is a completely different thing. We tend to confuse those concepts, but when you are here, you can understand it. A couple of months ago, we had this conversation with the NOAA hunters. These are scientists who literally fly into hurricanes. That plane is a flying laboratory. They've been flying into hurricanes for 50 years to take important measurements about wind speed, about pressures, about quantity of water. They have a first-hand feeling about what a hurricane is and what it does, and they share information with people like us on the ground to make decisions. They had a conversation with students from many countries, and they brought that first-hand experience, which is what completely transformed the way we think of hurricanes. Because they are empowered, they use um, tools like this one to find the safe path through the hurricane. Um, and it was like a really good learning experience. So for the, the maker lenses, I invite you to cook the nuggets, just to see how risk is built, to touch the fault. Um, but please don't fly into hurricanes. At least have a conversation with someone who does, and it still will be enriching. The second one is the system lenses. If we're going to deal with multi-hazard, we need to understand how the different risks are connected. In Easter Island, I was discussing coastal erosion with a fisherman, and he told me, the green needs the blue, and the blue needs the green, which sounded so poetic. And then he went on to explain how the different hazards in the island were connected, because um, a wildfire on the coast was affecting the marine ecosystems in the water. So he could see the system connecting the different type of hazards. We came out to map these uh, different hazards to understand how both hazards affected the coast, the, the coast, the erosion, coastal erosion affected the sculptures that are all around the coast that affected the tourism and then their in turn affected the economy. So that's in a way became a way to see the system. And we came up um, with a map of how, what are the things that increase the risks by tsunamis, what are the things that can decrease it. And this is important for us to understand what kind of interventions we can make. Because we're dealing with big risks and increasingly, comparatively speaking, with low resources to deal with them. So it's important to see how we can make and where we can make interventions. So in a way, creating models is really useful. They are, the models always say that all of them are wrong, but some are useful. And they are in a way an act of humility in which we understand some things that we can change and others that we can't. For example, we divide. This is the flood, but this is the impact of the flood. Okay, I will not be able to fix the flood, but I can work on the impact. How can I reduce and what are the interventions that I can do to reduce the impact? And just that the system thinking allows us to separate the two. The challenge there is not to become too abstract again and to be able to apply it to the real world scenarios like that fisherman who had that poetic poetic vision of it, but at the same time, understanding the mechanisms. The third one is the intervention lenses. Uh, we also call it the acupuncture lenses. Um, here in Brazil, a couple of decades ago, in the 90s, they invented the metaphor of urban acupuncture, in which they had to deal with very big, difficult problems, at the same time being able to make small-scale interventions that are there to revitalize a system. Like, have anyone been to acupuncture anytime? The acupuncture uh, lens is about seeing flows of energy and identifying where energy is blocked and then applying with a needle just to release or, or to um, uh, reduce that blockage. When you do it with a city, the typical example is that there's a rich uh, neighborhood living in Latin America. This is very, um, we, we, did, we see it very often. Uh, near a poor neighborhood, there's tension. So creating a public space, a shared public space, mendels the energy, it doesn't solve the structural problem, but at least it makes a difference. Um, this learning, 
I think is really useful for our field because we will be doing in the next few decades with problems so big that we really need to see how we can reduce risk. Uh, and also how we can identify blockages. And uh, I have an example of linguistic isolation. I've been in the same project in Bahamas, talking with the Haitian community that lives in the Bahamas, that doesn't speak English, so they are linguistically isolated. If you don't speak English there, you may not receive all the prevention messages in English. So the acupuncture there is that the community is creating a local radio in Creole language so that the prevention messages get to them. And if you see it in terms of information, you, you can see there was a blockage and an online radio, which is low cost, comparatively speaking, then connects people who were isolated. Padre Bernardo, he's a priest in Easter Island. He's going to be talking to us tomorrow in one of the talks. He realized that people were not participating in the tsunami drills. But he knew that everyone would listen to the church bell sound. Like uh, in the, the church bell is sound every time the mass is about to start or every time that something serious happens. So he realized that um, everyone would be, uh, was ever, uh, during the tsunami drill, everyone had to go to the church. So he said, I'm going to change the sound of the bells. I'm going to make it more dynamic to communicate tsunami drill. So during the drill, he changed the sound, and everyone was talking about it. And the participation increased a lot. Just because of that tiny, tiny change in the environment, just a change of the sound, and that helped the whole team that was working in the drill engage more people in the community. So we've seen different examples. There are small interventions that are really creative and they make a difference. Chile and Japan, they are connected, like they are miles away, 10,000 miles away, but they are connecting by tsunamis. Whenever there's a big earthquake in Chile, it sends a tsunami that reaches Japan the, Japan the following day. Whenever there's a big earthquake in Japan, it sends a, a tsunami to Chile. And that happened for decades or millennia. So every time that happens, the two countries get together. And culture takes responsibility for the tsunami. They say, I'm sorry for the tsunami that I sent you. And here's a present. And in this case, it's a Moai sculpture coming from Easter Island. I'm sorry, this sculpture is for you. And then they put that sculpture in Japan pointing towards Chile. And that present is witness of reconstruction. And at the same time, it's a risk reminder of where the next tsunami is going to come from. So again, this is just a present, but everyone, everyone in that town loves the Moai. Everyone connects with it. They have t-shirts, they have souvenirs. So that triggers a continuous conversation about an event that happens very rarely, very, very, not very often. So we discussed three lenses, and this one is about understanding behavior. And maybe the mo is the most powerful of them all if we can do it based on real insights coming from behavioral science. Like most areas coming from poly, public policy, they've been using behavioral science the last decade, I would say, that our fields still have lots of potential to use it. And in particular, if we understand the power of emotions and, what's, um, and if we have a systematic approach to emotions. They, tend, they tended to be overlooked during the last century, and now they are central because we know that there are no decisions without emotions. So, for example, if we want to deal with eco-anxiety, like people who feel so, so much anxiety about climate change, how are we going to revert that? Because anxiety is a type of fear, and that doesn't really get into action. If you talk to Earth scientists, for example, they are really stressed, they are angry, because they can see things in data and then they don't see the public reacting to it. So having a systematic approach to, uh, to different emotions is so important. Greta has been a very effective risk communicator through anger. And now what we know from emotions is that they have an evaluative component, that whenever we feel emotion, it's like an algorithm that triggers our connection, our interpretation of what's happening around us. Each emotion has an idea of where the source of risk is coming from, what can I do about it, and then a possible outcome. Anger, for example, um, it is associated with a, a very clearly identified source of, of risk and an idea of optimis optimism idea of the outcome. So that's why people may get into fights. It can be divisive in a way, and it may wear out over time, but at the same time, it's really powerful when you com communicate risk. Take pride, for example. Pride 
uh, is really powerful when you do good, communi good you do communications because it has this idea that I have feel an agency, I can do something about the risk that I'm dealing with. These kids participated in a campaign with this artist and the Topos Rescue Brigade, who will be uh, in a conversation with us tomorrow. And they did the video, they composed the song, and this is a prevention song alerting people about um, what you should do when the seismic alert sounds. And they felt part of the campaign, they owned the campaign, they feel pride. There was three weeks after that, there was an earthquake in Mexico, and the kids evacuated the school in only 40 seconds. So it really worked. And that song is played every year. So um, these are the three or four lenses that I propose. The first one, and the four of them are for us to reconnect with those systems. The, second, the first one is hands-on, and what I do is understand how risk is made. The in the second one, I understand how risks are interrelated. In the third one, I try to identify where I can make intervention. And in the fourth one, I try to understand how people are reacting or maybe reacting so that my interventions are more effective. I think this is a great opportunity for us to bring your own lenses. That th these lenses that come from different disciplines, from your personal experience, from different cultures. We could say that the biggest lenses of, all, of them all, that include them all, is culture. And this is what makes our field so interesting in the way that we perceive risk differently in line with our values, with our culture, with our emotion. I think this is, will be an opportunity for us to see how things look from different perspectives and different lenses that each of you bring. And that should make us stronger as a community. So I invite you to ride the waves of risk, to get into the water, beware there might be sharks, but let's um, bring your lenses and share it with the rest. Thank you very much.